Good afternoon. And welcome to Global Entrepreneurship at Westchester University. Today is our first event in this week's event. You can see the list up there. Hopefully after this week's event, you'll feel confident uh, in your own abilities or what you need to learn to become an entrepreneur. And that will kickstart you for entering the business plan competition, which has a due date of Sunday, November 30th. All you have to do by then is register that you wish to compete. Uh, if you need assistance with developing a business plan or running around this competition, please feel free to contact myself, Matt Shea, or Melissa Wolfie, who's your name, in the uh, Control Entrepreneurial Leadership Center. We will be more than happy to help you understand what the competition requires. Uh, you can see both of those things on the, on the tables there, brochures for the competition, and this week's Global Entrepreneurship Day. Uh, please help us keep track of our impact with these events. We'll have a sign-in sheet at the end. Uh, so that, before you leave, make sure you register your name if you would in mind. Today's speaker has spent 40 years in channel development, 37 for IBM, and 3 for InfoPrint Info Solutions. Over this time, his responsibility includes partner development, deal recruiting, product offerings, sales and product training, and revenue growth and collection. While at IBM, while, while at IBM, he achieved national recognition for revenue and quarter performance. He was the largest market producer for supplies and printer products, and he sold over 50% of IBM's discount manufacturing capacity. For the last eight years, he has volunteered at Store Chester and Delaware County, where he currently serves as the co-chair of the store. Please help me in welcoming Jerry. Thank you, Matt. This is going to be a fun class. I have been in front of college students for a long, long time. And if I mention something that you don't recognize, like a phone that goes shh, <laughs> that's what we started in the business with. Where you start with or faster than because you use both thumbs. And my thumbs are noise. Nowhere nearly as strong as all of yours are. This program uh, we're put, put together this morning is one we give to people that think they would like to be entrepreneurs. I am a counselor with Chester County Score, which is part of a national organization of approximately uh, 13,000 members with around 360 chapters around the United States. And we offer our services for free to mentor small businesses or businesses of any kind. And by that, we have uh, one to two hour sessions with them to mentor them on their ideas, their business plans, issues that they're facing, etc. We do workshops like this for people that are potential entrepreneurs. We do workshops for people that are interested in learning more about email and how to get effective email use to a company called Constant Contact. So we've got a wide variety of, system, uh, of uh, offerings here at Chester County. We're fortunate that in Chester County we have approximately 100 volunteers. So we're very wide and we're very deep. We have CEOs of companies that have offered their services to business people. And really what we get out of it is the joy of watching a business person succeed or decide maybe once they've really considered all the elements of business, that maybe that particular business was not the right model for them. Now, Matt, are they have different uh, experiences in the world? Okay. So, at any time, please feel free to ask any questions. Uh, I used to take questions from college students on why I was wore white shirts, but I think that was even before your time, because we were known for white shirts. And why did we dress that way? Why was that important in terms of when we were trying to sell a customer a million dollar solution? Why did we not want to look like, you know, like you're dressed today? And the question I ask back is how many of you will play football or field hockey without the equipment? And when you're in business, you want to appeal to the person that you're trying to sell to. And most high viewers were significantly younger than the people that they were selling to. And the people they were selling to were over 50. Generally wore white suits, or not white suits, but white shirts, and Brooke Brothers suits, and very shiny shoes. 
So you certainly didn't want to go in there and immediately get a standoffish approach by being dressed in appropriate. So you wanted to try to do some initial communication with them by doing that. So that's who we are here in Chester County. And again, this is our 50th year as an organization around the United States. We're a resource partner to the SBA, Small Business Association, and we work closely with them on a number of items. What is an entrepreneur? I'm sure this is going to be on one of your tests, right? Okay, this is just a definition right out of the dictionary. Innovative, self-reliant, opportunity focused. That's where we start from from an entrepreneur. Willing to take risks and exposure. In the years that I worked for IBM doing this, the thing that I got the most pleasure out of entrepreneurs was how creative they were, how just dedicated to that business they were, how they wouldn't want to work for a major corporation ever because they liked the freedom of what they were doing in spite of the trials that they went through on a daily basis in a broad range of, of areas from personnel to product to deliveries. Busy 24-7 in today's world. Staying up with their business where as an employee of a corporation, many of them come in at 8 o'clock in the morning, turn on the lights, 5 o'clock at night, turn off the lights, and don't worry about the corporation. Nowhere as dedicated as an entrepreneur is in making their business successful. So being able to accept risks is a big part of being an entrepreneur. The reason most people want to be an entrepreneur is make some money. You know, this ought to be easy. Have some fun doing it. Sign over the door, sign on a business card is my name. I'm proud of what I've done. I've got sweat equity in it. And I'll never find a, an employee that's as dedicated to my business as I am. So when you think about your business, nobody will have the same concerns that you have for running. One of the things that as an owner of a business, when you're bringing employees, is how do I help them talk about my business the way I would, to represent my business the way I would, because they are your reputation. And people like to do business with businesses that they feel good to you. How many people can buy Kellogg's Sports Legs and Wegmans? How many can buy them at an Acme? How many can buy them at a Giant? It's the same product. Why is one of those growing and maybe one or two of them just stagnant? What's the difference? Might be the entrepreneurialism that one of them has and how they got into the business and how they dedicate their employees to customer service and hire for customer service. Where do you like to buy product? You like to buy product from people that treat you right and deal with you right, whether it's you know storefront or whether it's web. You buy from people that you enjoy being, being uh, buying from and have confidence in. And then, in many of the people that I get to see, it's because businesses have downsized. And they've gone through a number of these downsizings, and they're tired of being laid off because they want steady income. So that's, that's some of the reasons that people get into business. And another one is they can make a difference. Make a difference in a lot of people's lives by starting a business and paying well. Make a difference in their own life because they don't want to get laid off a lot stability for their family, social contributions, be able to contribute back to the, the community that they grew up in, that they live in, as a good, solid corporate citizen. And I'm sure you all can think of more than, than I could ever think of. There's a lot of creativity in this room. All we have to do is help it grow. However, as an entrepreneur, when you put your business plans together, how many of you Ever worked on business plans? Ever looked at a financial side of it? Are you building money in for yourself as the owner? We encourage when people do business plans that they put up an amount of money in there per month that they want to take away from that business for themselves. Quite frankly, 
this area, I recommend about $4,000 a month. Because after taxes, that's probably the minimum certain people can live on in this area. You should get a reasonable return on the amount of money you're putting in this business. Even for the simplest business, I had a woman this morning I was talking with. She's selling a cosmetic jewelry. Or costume jewelry, not costume jewelry. Costume jewelry. I said, well, you know, it's a catalog operation. I said, did they give you your catalogs? She said, no, I got a Bible. Did they give you your cell phone? No, I had to buy that. Are they paying your cell phone bill? No. Are they paying your internet bill? No. So even a simplistic business that she runs from her house, or she said, I did have to buy my inventory. They told me to pay retail for that. Everything else is kept in their warehouses. Because she probably had to look at it on an annual basis the first year. She probably had three or $4,000 invested just in getting her business up and running out of her pocket. And she could have left that money in a bank. Banks don't pay a lot. But at the end of the year, she still would have had three or $4,000 in the bank. With this adventure, she may or may not have three or $4,000 in the bank. So she should expect a return on that money. And that's a low cost to get into a business. And then last, you should be able to grow a business, if it's a, it's a business you want it to be, and sustain it. And maybe even plan an exit strategy. That was a client a few uh, weeks ago. Their exit strategy was they wanted to grow their business and in about seven years sell it three times their uh, gross revenues through some investment or some other company that would be big enough to buy it. So they were looking to build their business from about a million dollars to a five million dollar over a period of a few years because of the amount of money they expect to be able to sell the business for at that particular time. No guarantees, but that's the exit strategy that they were working for. Unpleasant facts about being an entrepreneur, 90% of them go out of business within two years. And a large percentage of them go out of business after that. So they fail. Some of the reasons that they fail is a lack of knowledge. They don't know what they're doing. I've never made a donut in my life. I'm not about to open a donut store from scratch unless I hire the right people and have enough money to do it right, equipment-wise, experience-wise, to make it a success. Or I could buy a Dunkin' Donut franchise or Donut school. So I can make the donuts the way Duncan wants me to make them. But they're going to spend six to eight weeks training me to be a baker of their particular product. Insufficient working capital. You probably haven't experienced, but many companies, especially small companies, run out of cash. And they spend more time worrying about where they're going to get the money to pay for their supplies subcontractors that work for them, as opposed to spending that same time working on and in their business. So just having enough cash available while they're waiting to be paid by whoever they're doing the work for or whoever they're selling to is an issue. And it comes up a lot. And when you have to worry about how am I going to make my payroll, how am I going to pay my suppliers, how am I going to repay any loans I have, how am I going to take any money out of this for myself? How much time are you spending working on your business? You're worried about paying, paying people and paying suppliers. Many of them set unrealistic goals on the front end. I think that I'll sell 10,000 of these in this marketplace, and the marketplace might only absorb 5,000. So they built an unrealistic model and how many can realistically sell? Be like, uh, I guess I guess I came on to this campus and thought I let's see there what thirty thousand students in this semester? I remember. Oh, thirty thousand. I'm not going to sell these nice fur coats like Howard Eskin does. I'm going to mark the thirty thousand. How many would be willing to bet how many I can sell? Now, I thought I could sell all those and at least show up at the football game and stay with them. 
There might be three or four thousand potential. But I think it's a lot less, realistically speaking. If I build an unrealistic forecast, because people go to football games here in Westchester, they cold this time of year. Maybe I think the market is bigger than the community is. And the last one is, I really thought I'd enjoy doing this type of thing, but I don't. I changed my mind about doing this. Or something might have happened where I physically cannot do that work anymore. Maybe I was a laborer doing painting, doing roofing, doing something that required uh, full use of all of these arms and legs and strength that I have, and I got sick or broke a leg. Or I cut myself. Right? I just decided that that is not something that I'm going to do anymore and expose my hands and arms and limbs to injury. So things happen in business. Again, that also is part of the dynamics of it, which make it fun, make it exciting, but also a risk. Many of them didn't have a strategic plan. Not that that's a guaranteed reason to be successful, but if I can cook you the best meal that you've ever had, does that qualify me to be a restaurant owner? Do I know how to run the front end of an operation, how to do all that reservation stuff, pay the bills, worry about personnel, worry about liquor control, and I, if I have fortunate enough to have a liquor license, how do I control what's going on at the bar in terms of just the inventory of the bar? It's the business that some people learn, by the way, as to just keep control of what's been sold on a weekly basis to make sure your employees aren't stealing from it. Issue a lot of restaurants. Was my business concept a good one? That I think was something that was terrific and I just jumped into business, got money and put it into there, my own money, and all of a sudden found out that nobody wanted what I had to sell. That I wasn't solving a problem in their minds as much as I was solving a problem in my mind. I might mean, think it's great idea. But if nobody else does, how successful are you going to be? So I've been tested it all. I can tell you that every major player in the marketplace, especially consumer markets, test markets a product. Even when they do that, mistakes are made. Coca-Cola pulled classical Coke off the market. They didn't do that just, oh, well, let's pull it off the market, we got this new product, which is a lot better. Incidentally, Pepsi had a product that they were about to announce that Pepsi did not announce because Coke got back in the market so quickly. Okay. So, testing a product, testing a concept is, is workable, is doable, even when you do, it doesn't guarantee success. That's all we're saying. Again, lack of knowledge of the industry is just another reason. Lack of capital, lack of sources of capital. Just poor understanding of financial statements. You don't know how to read them, how are you going to make them money or not? Uh, we had a score counselor at a friend out on the West Coast that had a, I believe it was a bridal shop. He tells a story about these folks that the business was barely breaking even, but they had been in business, they had been successful. But now that business was changing. So the question was, do we close the business or keep it open? They had people working for them, so they good citizens kept the business open. The next couple of years they bled through their personal savings. But they still thought they could turn it around. Next five years they bled through their 401k plans. For seven years, employees got paid, whoever owned the building got paid. All the suppliers got paid, and the owners went broke. Probably should have made the decision seven years prior to that to close the business. They chose not to do that, and they were the ones that felt the pain at the end of the experiment of trying to keep it going. So just understanding where you are and when is the right time to pull the plug on a business. It may have been a great business, 
may have been successful for you. But no one to pull the plug is important as well. Any questions on any of this so far? Great. Matt, you're not allowed to ask any of this. Alright. So it's not businesses don't go into business and fail to plan or, or plan to fail. They fail to plan. There's nothing worse than an entrepreneur coming in to see a score counselor and say, look at this, just signed a three-year lease on this building. I'm going to put a dress shop in there. Great. What else have you planned for? I'm going to open my dress shop in November. Oh. How do you plan to staff it? What kind of expenses are you going to have? What's your market going to be? What are you going to do with excess inventory at the end of the season? How do you plan on, on selling that off? What kind of terms did you get from your suppliers? How much inventory is going to take to stock? Did you get any kind of terms from the suppliers in terms of how soon you have to pay them? They're just going to give it to you to put on your racks? You're going to have to invest some money in that. So we see people that haven't taken the effort to plan. And that's not to say you can't be successful without a business plan. However, you know, if you don't know what road you're going to take, any of them will do. What's that from? Monica. Monica, you know, goes from Alice in Wonderland. Right? If you don't know where you're going, how are you going to get there? So a business plan, being a simplistic one, forcing you to write on paper some of your ideas, who your competition is, who's your target market. How can you plan your marketing programs if you don't know who you're selling to. I need social media. Oh, what's your business? I do corporate mergers and acquisitions. Well, how much do you think social media is going to do for corporate mergers and acquisitions? How about search engine optimization? Or I'll put my money into that so if anybody's looking for a top notch legal firm, I pop up on top. My old firm is spending $10,000 a month on that type of marketing expense. However, same for want to do uh, drug arrests, DUIs, social media might be the perfect place for them to be. So when you look at your marketing strategies, you need to know who your target audience is going to be before you get into some of the strategy. In my opinion, I don't know what, what, what you learn here, but again, I need to know where I'm going and know how to reach it. What's the fastest group on uh, Facebook these days? Over 50. How many of you are still using Facebook? And Twitter? Or have you switched to something else? The last group of, I saw a, a small group of college students at uh, Cheney a couple weeks ago. And they're beyond Facebook and Twitter right now. It's not as big for them as it is for others. But why is that important? You can do some marketing off Facebook today. You can do some target marketing off Facebook today because they've changed the way it works. You can put up a Facebook post that used to go to everybody who was your friend. Now through some magical formulas that they use, it doesn't go no more. There's a shop in Chester County that wanted to reach a certain demographic. They put it up on Facebook and their reach was 700 of their friends or people that follow this particular commercial side of the business. That's when a person teaching this couple weeks ago said, hit the boost button on the side. Boost button. Hit the boost button. See this? Facebook will not let you have access to who's in their database. Hit the 25 mile radius around the business. Give me the people over 40, male and female. Hit the boost button. And for about 20 bucks, they went from having 700 people looking at the open house in response to it. Took 1,800 people looking at it. Can't tell you how many have showed up. But I can tell you they can target market to an audience they might not have thought of before. And the audience they wanted was the over 40 crowd. So understanding who they were going to market to, what were some of the things that they might see, and inexpensive for a target market versus dropping something in every mailbox which is also a So, know your audience, know what they're doing, can help you 
determine what kind of marketing programs you might want to have from the smallest to the largest of companies. How do people get in business? Three different ways. You can start it on your own, you can buy a franchise, or you can buy an existing business. Everybody's happy. So, 
Tony protecting himself. Oh, yeah, certified this, certified that, blah, 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 blah. Fine, fine, no problem. I can't stop him from buying it. Product can ship, product can split on the airplane while he's driving to the bank and cash his check for $100,000. Finds out it's a bad check. Tony owes me $90,000. Not me, but my company. My company's not going to forgive them because somebody didn't pay them. We still want our $90,000. I thought it was a $3 or $4 million business. He had to sell another $1 million in product just to pay us. A million dollars. That was growing his business by a third in a very short order of time to pay our bills, to pay, pay what he owed our bills. The last was, this girl had been working for me for three or four years. I happened to come into the office one day. A Saturday weekend, I picked up the mail. It's on the floor. Bank statement was there. I opened the bank statement. Took a look at the checks, which I normally don't do. I found a check written to Mary Jones for $20,000. I don't pay Mary Jones $20,000. So I went and looked at QuickBooks. Check number 1234. 1234 in QuickBooks is the ABC Supply Company. That line, Mary Jones has stolen $100,000 from this show. Mary Jones was going to jail if she didn't pay him back. He too was a $2 million business. $100,000 is a lot of profit that they have to make up for. He was fortunate over a period of three years, he got $85,000 back. All three of these cases were some trust, faith, without some inspections to make sure that they weren't hurt. They were all reasonable assumptions. First guy didn't have a real good handle on this inventory. Didn't know how much was missing. Didn't have any controls in place to measure it as tightly as he should have. Next guy just didn't have enough experience to deal with international uh, buying and selling. Then he could avoid that mistake. And the last one again was not inspecting those books off to make sure that the gal had taken money from the first time it happened. Because it had happened over a period of time. But they kept our passion. They still were in business. Overcame it, some sleepless nights, but the passion and the desire stayed there. If you're a sole operation and you should get sick, or if you're not healthy going into it, how do you expect to sustain what you're doing? If you're producing the income. So how is your health? How is the health? I mean, I'm a coder. I've been hired to go out and work on code for some company. They're paying me $100,000 a year. If I get sick, what happens? I don't show up. They're not going to pay me. They have no liability to me. I just a 1099 employee. So how is the health of your own health? Do you have the energy to carry through? We had some people in the class this morning that the a woman and her husband worked a full-time job but had a part-time business going after them. Well, how many hours a day do you have to spend and how much energy do you have to do eight, nine hours at your normal job, then go into running some additional businesses at night or on the weekends without burning out? over a period of time. Depending on your age, depending on your energy, depending on your health, all from that up. So do you have the energy for what you're taking on? You get up every morning wanting to, I'm going to say sell something. And nothing happens in business until somebody sells something. And in spite of having bad days, you're going to get up the next morning feeling as fresh you did as the day you went into the business. The same excitement, same enthusiasm, same desire to go after it, same competitive action, because you, you need a lot of that to convince the customer that you're the right person to buy from, because you got the right product for them, you got the right solution for whatever the problem is. And you got to convince them that a lot of it is. Oh, why don't you buy my product? 
It's the best on the market. We're talking to customers that want to feel your excitement, your enthusiasm, and sometimes need to be convinced. Got people working for you, how are you going to lead them? What's your leadership style? How are you going to get them to act on your behalf? To represent your company, your business, the way you want to represent it in front of you, in the eyes of the customers that you're trying to gain. They will never have your passion. They're employees. No matter how good you are to them, they won't have your passion. But there might be some things you can do with a compensation plan that gets them to be a little more loyal, work a little harder, whether they're administrative, sales, marketing, repair, whatever it is. What is your style going to be, and how are you going to impact your employees? And I own a, 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 any business, especially retail, or I had somebody answer the phone and said, well, what do you want? Tell me I help you. How do you get the phones answered properly? I dealt with people that remarketed and typewriters from an IBM perspective. To me, the most important person in the operation is not the owner, not the salespeople. Think back to when I did this. I, I don't know if the roads were big. That's a joke. But the receptionist. Who answered every call that came into that business? Who was the first person that anybody walked in? Did they see? If that person didn't represent that business property and left a call on hold too long, what impression does the person on the other end of the line or the person walking in have of that business? Okay? So they'd be all well, receptionists. Well, I couldn't find somebody to work for me for whatever they were willing to pay. So why are you paying so low? That's the most important person you have. They didn't recognize it. They didn't view the job the way I view the job as being one of the most critical ones in the entire operation because they, they were in contact with every customer. Every customer went through them at one point in time. Commitment to follow through. I mean, we, we talk about customer service, we talk about doing business with people you like to do business with. To me, what's critical is you get a phone call, you return a phone call. If I tell Monica, Monica, I'm going to call you back. I can't give you an answer right now, I'm going to make some phone calls, but I'll call you by 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. I make all my phone calls to find out I cannot do what I thought I could get done for Monica. Now I've got to call her back and tell her I couldn't get it done. I can't get your product delivered today. So I call Monica back between 8 and 9. Or should I let her sit there between 9 and 12 wondering what's going on? What's happening? My style was always get a friend of them. They may not like the news, but they appreciate knowing ahead of time, as soon as you've got it, we'll follow through standpoint. How many of you? And I don't think anybody here has dealt with contest from getting service. Okay, there's a now, we'll be there tomorrow. What time? When we want them. That's kind of the answer you get. At least now they're within a two hour window. There are times when we show up. You want me to pull my heels all day, wait for your guy to show up? What kind of service is that? That stinks. Because I got things to do too. I'm as valuable as that person is. So I think we all need to look at customers in the eyes of. Who are they? What are they? How do we treat them? Treat them the way you want to be treated? Or treat them like a, eh, you don't need your business. Okay? It comes, it, it'll come back and hurt you in the long run. That's a, that's a subject for a whole other class. This is one of my favorites because I, I could never walk into an entrepreneur, most of mine are small. But I couldn't picture a rack of hats five across and five deep. Because you name every job that happens, and that person was responsible for it. They were the CEO, they took the calls. They were the sales department, they took the orders. They wrote the proposals. They became the billing department. When bills were paid on time, they were the collection department. 
paper towels needed in the restroom? They did that. Rugs need vacuum in the hallway? They did that. Had a contractor painter to get the place painted? That was their job. You name it, that's what an entrepreneur does. So whenever you think about small operation, think of the various jobs that you're going to have <coughs> over and beyond what you got into that business to begin with. Because these all need to be done. They don't go away unless you hire somebody to do it. So you either do it yourself or you hire somebody to do it. Which is not necessarily all that bad. Because sometimes if you look at the time value of money, I sat in a class last week. We were talking about uh, web design and pictures and this, that, and other thing. There's a very, very intelligent person who came in and said, if you're designing for print, you need to think of these four colors. Because that's how you do things on print. And this is the kind of software you need for print. If you're designing for the web, you need to think of these three colors, red, blue, and green, because they create all the colors on the screen. And this is the program that you need on that. And he went back and forth and explained the difference of what kind of programs you could use. And I said, very great, but you look around the room of entrepreneurs, so let me ask you a very basic question. What does somebody with your talent cost? He says, I don't know, 50, 75 dollars an hour. So, okay. I got this three panel thing. I know what I want on what panels and what side. What's it going to cost me to get this done? He says, probably four hours worth of work. I don't have time to sit there to try to be a design expert, lay this thing out, worry about whether I'm going to print it, put it up on the website. So in my budgeting process, I need to think about, maybe I need people to do this for me. Yeah, I can do it myself. But I could spend probably three days doing it and still not have it as good as this guy can do it. Those are just some of the things that you might want to contract out to do. And again, in thinking about being an entrepreneur, the most important one I left off was the one on the bottom. Are you a parent? Little League? All the extracurricular activities that if you're a parent, children need. And they need a parent there to show the interest to help them develop as well. So all of these are demands upon the owner's time. And that's why it is not a 9 to 5 job or an 8 to 5 job, it's 24 7, because it's one of them. I'm not going to read the questions to you, I'll just let you look at it very quickly. It's been maybe 15 seconds on this and not another. I'll ask you to take self assess yourself as entrepreneurs. How many of these things meet what you want to do? Any surprises out there? Here's the other half. If you don't like doing these things, maybe entrepreneurialism, being a business owner, is not for you. Because they're all things that are going to come up. And you try to run your business. If you don't like dealing with people, what kind of business are you going to be in? There may be somewhere you don't have to deal with people. But for the most part, there's going to be some interpersonal actions that are required. Or an introvert, you know, just put it in a slot, or push it off the slot, or finish, or throw it to me an email, I'll look at it, throw it back at you, and it's finished. You might be able to do that. Anyway, so again, a validation concept if you're going to be in business, what kind of business are you going to be in? Who needs what you're going to do? What problem are you solving? Okay. Um, if I were to relate to you, hmm, I think I can remember when pencils didn't have erasers on them. But you had a big eraser that was sitting on the desk. And whenever you made a mistake, you got your eraser. Or maybe I'll go with typewriters and coat. Typewriters. So, type paper or typewriters? Typewriters, we got auto correction typewriters. That was a big deal. Before, when you had a typewriter, it was a machine with keys like your keyboard, but Struck ink on a piece of paper and made a mistake, 
I got an erase crowd, I've erased it, I've got some white out, white it, retyped it. Self-correcting became a big deal in these things. Why well, it was important? Because you see it all the time of correcting. Why well, putting an eraser on the end of a pencil was important was now you could just turn it over. You didn't have to look for your eraser, which somebody made you borrow. You didn't have it at your desk all the time. Only it's going to cost you two cents a pencil more. Isn't that worth it? Two cents to you, sir? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How much time would you spend doing something else? So, whatever your feature is, what's the benefit to the customer? So, as you think of whatever your products are going to be, whatever feature you're going to have, ask yourself, who cares? Why is it important? If you're going to get into the uh, business competition, it's great competition. And Mark knows that we offer support counselors to work with you in terms of helping you get prepared for that competition. It's $10,000 first prize. Anybody care about $10,000? Hands? Yeah. Anybody care enough to, to put the tight end to win it? You had a winner out here, what, two years ago? Um, didn't, didn't she win that competition? Business idea competition. Didn't she win that? I thought I heard she went on the... She did, she was not the final prize. Okay. Right. Semi-final. Semi-final. That was what, 5,000? Peanuts. I know nobody needs that money now, but this is a very wealthy area. Anyway, validate your idea. Realist, realistic assessment. I mean, there are no secrets in a lot of these business things. All businesses need the same ingredients to do business. Who are you? What are you? Who are your customers? How are they going to obtain it? Where are you going to manufacture it? What are your costs? What are you going to sell it for? What's your break even point? And I don't care whether you're baking cakes, sewing buttons on suits, have a consulting business. You've got the same issues from a basic standpoint. I think if you've attended any classes, if that doesn't come out to you, every business has the same ingredients. They go at them differently. But it's the same ingredients. So it doesn't make a lot of difference what you're doing uh, in terms of what you're going to need to get there. Unbiased. That's why it's important to bounce your ideas. That's why mentors are important. You know, you can think you've got the greatest business in the world. You can do all this self-assessment. And you can convince yourself that you're going to make a million dollars out of it. Is that realistic? Take the chance and ask some, some people that can mentor you what they think of your idea. See if they are as high, as excited about it as you are. If they are, wonderful. If they're not, what don't they like? Okay. And a uh, fellow I talked to was going to. Uh, Put a uh, truck on the street, food truck on the street. There wasn't another food truck like it in the community. He was going to be the only food truck of this type, and he was going to have all the business. My question was, those people eat today. He said, oh yeah. He said, what do they eat? Food. Oh, okay. You're in the food business. Yeah. Who do you think your competition is? Everybody else is supplying food. They might not have your whatever you're going to put on your truck. There might not be another one for 500 miles around here. That doesn't mean these people are going to flock to you just because you have that product. Okay. And if it's successful, what's going to happen? Competition. That's a great idea. Why don't we do it too? The same way. Another one is. Provincial licenses, like you need. What kind of zoning requirements, like you need? These are unexpected things that happen. This one lady was in the landscaping business this morning. She says, you know, unfortunately, we learned about that one the hard way. We were doing something, and somebody knocked on the door and said, you need a permit to do that. Oh, really? They didn't look. Okay, so be aware of some of the regulations that might be given that you as an entrepreneur may not be aware of. There are certain areas within Chester County you can't put a sign up if you're in there. Met a guy that has a, uh, a farm in Chester County with goats and making goat cheese. Let me tell you, it took him two 
years before he could sell his first product. Because there's county inspectors, state inspectors, federal inspectors. He's inspected minimum once a month by inspectors. And if he wants to expand, the next question is, are the goats eating the same stuff at the next farm? The three to a year farm. Or do you have a difference in the quality of the product that's going to come out because of the quality of the grass or the grain or the whatever they're eating at the other farm? How do you control that? Problems of exchange? He was limited. So, steps to start the business to what you're going to do. We recommend you prepare, prepare a very basic business plan. Get it right. We have one that we use uh, at a company called Ann's Nursery. And say if you take Ann's, which is a simple eight or nine page business plan, stretch out Ann's for Jerry's cookware and this, that, and the other thing, you'll have noted in your mind that you covered a lot of the areas. Ann was a graduate from Penn State in cultural school, knew the local area, knew the local economy, had called on local businesses, was well familiar with products that she was going to sell, who she could sell to, how big the market was going to be, what channels she was going to go to market with, how she was going to promote the product. Got it all done in about eight pages. Doing the financial side of that is kind of interesting because I asked you two questions. How much does it cost you to open the doors? Going to have a food truck. What's that going to cost you to build a food truck? How much inventory are you going to have? What insurance do you need? What license do you need? Before you can sell product one. And the next one is, is how much does it cost you to keep the door open every day? What's your cost associated with most businesses daily? Now we've got our, our cost structure. What are you going to sell? How much profit are you going to make on it? When does the profit line cross the expense line? And that's called.
you're going to just take a contract off the internet and say this is good enough for me? Are you a lawyer? Do you know that well enough? Do you think you're protected? Or do you think you might want to have a lawyer look at that that represents you? Because it's your contract, and that's what you're going to get to have to stand behind when you go to collect something or something happens that you don't like. So just like the art, design the artwork, you might want a lawyer. If you're going to be on the internet business and have an internet site that's taking orders over the internet, that's shipping out of an inventory someplace, that's collecting, are you sophisticated enough to build that site so that you can bring money in, get your money, send out a shipping notice to the end user when it's shipping, follow that order from soup to nuts, or is that something you got to spend some money to get done? Okay? All the legitimate that you can do yourself, or you can hire somebody to do, but all need to be figured into the budget, either time or money, to get a business up and running. So you can find out where I'm going to sell, who am I going to sell it to, who needs it. Does it save time or money for anybody? Is it worth what value you want to put on it? Does it solve the problem? What makes you unique? Why are you different than anybody else? This one I don't quite agree with because it talks about a lower price. I never believe in a lower price. You sell it on price, you're going to lose it on price. I'd at least have you sell it above, a little bit above, or depending on the value that you've got in the product, that you can demonstrate a lot above. You can get a higher price for a comparable product, as long as you've got the value to justify why you're spending money. And that's important. You've got to prove the value. Why should I care about your product? There are a couple of other ingredients. Okay. The business plan is your plan, you keep it, you review it, you look at it, it helps you measure whether you're on track with where you want it to be at this particular place or at this particular time in your business. If you've got a financial model that you've built in, are you above or below where your financial model you says you're going to be? Why are you there? So, you need to know what your net worth is. You need to have a decent credit score. If you're a new business, banks don't want to talk to you. They want to see three years of financials. So where are you going to get the capital for your business? So you want to identify your sources of funding. Where are they going to come from? How much do you really need to start this business? How much do you need to sustain it? If you talk to a lawyer or a company, it would absolutely tell you you make sure you keep your business expenses separate. Two credit cards, if you're operating off a credit card, so it's easily identified. You don't want the IRS coming in here and saying, oh, Mr. Francis, you bought all of this stuff on one American Express card. You said, this stuff you bought from Costco for $500 is all business supplies, and this stuff you bought from Costco for $32.12 was me. How do I know it wasn't $32 in business supplies and $500 to me? I don't want to open it up for an IRS inspector. I keep all my expenses on a separate car, and I have a separate checking account. I mean, that's just logical. I know that these don't include all of them, but here's a, one source that you can look at. You know, let's all look at all the crops on funding sources. Talk about business. Five years ago, you had Kickstarter. There were probably 900 sites that now are trying to do the same thing from a fundraising perspective. And I know you're all familiar with, familiar with those. Uh, not necessarily all of them, but the concept of how they work, what they're doing, whether you're looking at a non-profit opportunity or a for-profit opportunity. There are places that you can get funding if the right if the idea is right. Still got to build your marketing story. Still got to have a good presentation as to why <coughs> what you have people should invest in. There's a company here in Westchester made some kind of an athletic firm. I forgot what I was supposed to do, maybe change colors. It doesn't make any difference. They went to Kickstarter. They had a very, very successful fundraising opportunity, and everybody that put money in was going to get one of these products. First thing that happened was their supplier didn't give them the right material. It didn't do what it was supposed to that they claimed it was going to do. 
So they had a delay on the second supplier. Second supplier sent it in, and people are getting a little antsy because they had a lot of people subscribe to this thing. It was a three-person operation. And guess what? Second supplier didn't meet the quality standards. So now you got 1,500 disappointed people who put money in, who were willing to talk about a product that he hadn't gotten yet, and they didn't know how they were going to solve it. Even if the product came in right, it was a three-person operation. How long do you think it would take them to make 1,500, whether it's t-shirts or whatever it was? So they were successful, they got the money, they put the deliver the product. Because there might have been some processes up front in terms of quality control, materials that they were going to use to build their product with just didn't work the way they were supposed to work. So the question is, can you go in business or should you go in business? And quite frankly, when we do some of our classes, people making a no decision is as right as making a yes decision. When you consider what it might cost you to go in business, can you make the kind of money you want to make in that business? If when you decide, after you've looked at it and done a little bit of analysis on it, that it's not the right business, you may save yourself five to $10,000 just to get into that business, maybe more. That's not a bad decision. But at least you've got to put a logical reason for why you, you chose that method. And the same token, if you chose to go in it, at least know why you chose to go in it. Because you've documented a lot of it, you've researched it, and you kind of know where you want to go on that business road. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for your time. We're just in County Score. We've got a few minutes for questions. Anybody have any questions? If not, I get the pleasure of letting them out of class early. Okay? So thank you for your time, your attention, and I'll be around if you've got any questions, you want to ask me once we're done. Thanks again. Appreciate your presence.